Go back uh, in your Bible with me to Matthew 13. I mentioned last week that this was, um, I really felt this was an intentional pastoral kind of word from, from the Lord to just kind of share about Matthew 13 and the parable of the sower. And, you know, we talked about how um, Jesus doesn't interpret all his parables, but he interpreted this one. And that, you know, that really means something to me. And as I chewed on that even more, it came out of my mouth last week, but I hadn't really chewed on it much. And as I chewed on it over the week, I thought, you know, this must be a really important parable. You know, it's like Jesus said, this is something that you have to get. You, you can't miss this one. And so I'm going to interpret this parable for you to make sure that you don't miss its intended purpose. And so, um, you know, let's, let's read again Matthew 13. Verse 13, this is why I speak to them in parables, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, you'll be ever seeing but never perceiving, for this person, for this people's hearts has become calloused, they hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their ears, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would, I would heal them. We talked about, you know, the issue here wasn't hearing. It was the people that hear, and we hear a lot, you know. You come on Sundays, you, you hear stuff, and you watch YouTube videos, and you watch different preachers, you read different books, and... You know, it's not a matter of, of hearing. In this instance, the people heard. It was a matter of understanding. And the reason the understanding didn't come, the, the reason the seeds didn't take root is because they fell on hard ground, because they fell on hard soil. And so we talked about the hardness of the heart and how hardness of heart can kind of creep in there sometimes without us even knowing it. And the danger of a hard heart is that you sit in church or you watch your YouTube videos and you're hearing, but there's never any transformation. There's no growth. The, the seeds that are falling are falling on hard soil. They're, they're not actually bearing fruit, falling on good soil. See, the most mature believers are not the ones who have clocked the most hours in church, but the believers who continually tend the garden of their hearts and submit to the voice of the Lord. It's not always the, the amount of hours you clock watching YouTube videos or, or listening to preaching because if those seeds aren't falling on good soil, they aren't falling in the soil of your heart and producing fruit, then, then nothing's going to come of it. Nothing's going to grow. No, nothing's ever going to transform. And because these verses declare that there's still hearing that happens, there is a danger in believing that because our knowledge is growing that we're growing. You can continually hear and fill your head with knowledge, but as this parable talks about, it's the condition of the heart that receives what's coming in here and makes it alive in here and then bears fruit from here. You can't always bear fruit from up here, but you can always bear fruit from in here. There's a danger that, you know, we think we're, we're growing if our knowledge is growing. You know, Paul so eloquently puts it when he says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Look, there's nothing wrong with knowledge as long as it makes its way from here into here and it lands on good soil so that it can produce fruit. It's, it's almost like, you know, we quote this verse a lot, we speak the truth in love. Right? We speak the truth. The truth is the knowledge. The, the truth is the words, the verses. But it's got to be done in love, and, and love encapsulates the, the heart part. Right? They've, they've got to be paired up. They've, they've both got to operate because if there's a hard heart, all you've got is knowledge. And just rehearsing knowledge without the tangible love of God being expressed through your life usually doesn't produce much fruit. The danger is, if we continue to live in hard-heartedness, that we will simply be a people 
that know a lot of stuff but can't represent Jesus in our actions. You can look throughout the earth today. Maybe you can look back at your journey and, and recognize settings or, or places where you've seen this, where you've seen people that know a lot. They can quote a lot. You know, they've, they've, they've digested a lot of teaching. But you look at their life and you think, you know, where's the disconnect? What's happened between here and here? There's nothing landing on good soil and producing fruit. We will simply be a people that know a lot of stuff but can't represent Jesus in our actions. I remember talking for a couple Sundays, um, maybe a month or two ago, when we talked about, you know, how, how to live, right? Let's live like Jesus in the method and the way he did, where he did only what he saw his father doing, right? And he, he spoke only what he heard his father saying. Now, that's... That's a really good model and a really good way to live. And it's interesting that this passage in Matthew 13, this, uh, this parable of the sower, actually addresses those very two things, right? It says, though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear. So hard-heartedness actually attacks, is the enemy of living like Jesus. Hard-heartedness actually becomes a barrier from you seeing what it is the Father's doing and living that way and hearing what it is that He's saying and speaking forth those words of life, speaking forth those, those words in season. See, the, the hearing and seeing is the way Jesus lived, to see what the Father was doing, to say what the Father was saying. Hard-heartedness is a direct enemy to not only living as Jesus did, but it's a, it's a direct enemy to manifesting our lives on earth as it is in heaven. The very thing that Jesus asked us to pray for, you know, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, this, this hard-heartedness. I can assure you... <laughs> I can assure you that the enemy is working overtime to make sure that there is offense in the church. That there is offense between believers, that there is offense between family members. I can assure you that he is working overtime to make sure that there is hurt and pain and that he can do everything he can to stop any kind of healing in your life. God's portion for you today is healing and wholeness, and forgiveness, and liberty of heart, and relationship. His portion for you is to experience His unconditional love, and as Jesus said, love others as I have loved you. Because He has loved you, and forgiven you, and given you unconditional love, you can then release that to others. Has anybody ever wronged you before? Will anybody ever wrong you again? Yes, grace, forgiveness, the unconditional love of God. It has to be. It has to be an operation in our lives. It has to be an operation in the church. The enemy wants to divide and conquer. But when we forgive, we stop his division and we unite. You know, the enemy's really good at twisting sometimes things that are said. You know, he's so good that if you think back to when Jesus was in the desert, he was let, led into the wilderness by the Spirit, the, the devil's tactic was to use the Bible. The, the devil's tactic was to take the Word of God, but just give it a little twist. You know, speak it from a different spirit take it from a, from a different perspective, to, to use it as lies. He, he's really good at twisting things. And there are, there are things that are said from the pulpit. There are things that are said in life groups. There are things that are said at um, yard work things. There, there, there are words spoken because we're in community, and, and, and speech 
and words. Conversation is one of the major forms of communication. But he, he loves to twist things. He loves to make sure that, that you try to hear it in a, in a different way. And um, Yes, the truth. The truth will set us free. Grace, love, and forgiveness in the house. You know, Jesus was a major influence, of course, being fully God, fully man. Jesus was a major influence in discipling the disciples, right? And <laughs> you're going to love this. And uh, we see all these examples in this journey that the disciples have with Jesus. And I mean, this is Jesus, right? Loving Jesus, caring Jesus, uh, all wisdom, all knowledge, all power. I mean, they're, 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 they have the honor of living with, with Jesus, walking with him daily, having meals with him, you know, seeing him do miracles and, and learn that way. And yet there are moments where, you know, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You know, there are moments that uh, I'm sure Peter was tested by what Jesus said to him. Am I going to take offense? You know, am, am I going to be hurt? Things happen in growth, in communities. That verse that says iron sharpens iron. You know, I'd, I love that verse. And it's true. You sharpen me, hopefully I help sharpen you. But have you ever heard knives being sharpened? Is there anybody else here where that kind of grates you? Where the hairs on your neck kind of stand up? And it's this, this clanging of metal and, <laughs> you know, well, sometimes that's what maturing and growth is like. When the person sitting beside you or the person standing in front of you kind of, kind of grates you a little bit, right? So, you know, Jesus, I mean, this isn't a fair comparison, but, you know, Jesus was obviously a test for the disciples on their, on their growth process. And I can speak for myself because I, I know myself that I know I've been a test for many people. And in, in many ways, let, let me tell you just a few. Um, my age has been, has been a test for many. Uh, before I've even spoken words to people, I know that I've been judged. Now, I'm, I'm older than I was. Tomorrow I'll be older than I am. But there are settings where, you know, I've had the honor of, of participating with other leaders in things. And I'm, I'm usually the youngest member of the group. And there is judgment that happens. And you know what? It's actually a test. It's, it's a test for, for those people that make judgments, right? If out of the mouth of babes, right? I mean, there's people younger than me that carry incredible revelation and have incredible anointing, and do we judge them by their age, or, or do we accept that, you know, God's hand is on their life, and, you know, I offend people because I teach, and when you teach, you have to speak intelligible words. At least that's what I try to do every Sunday. But there's a really good chance that at some point along the line, you're going to disagree with something I say. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but th there's a good chance that that may happen. And... Uh, you know, I'm kind of off on a rabbit trail, and I don't know where to land it. But, um, you know, the, the, the truth is I'm getting that hard-heartedness. And we just have to continue to move forward as a community in a manner where we position our hearts before the Lord. You know, I, I try to, the best as possible, point to Him in all things and be humble enough to say, hey, if I got it wrong, I know the person that's got it right. And he's leading and guiding us, and we're going to be okay. 
I try to exert enough leadership that I'm being faithful to the call on my life, but not enough that I ever come close to taking his place in any way, shape, or form. Enough humility that, you know, I'd rather sit down there the whole service and just let him lead if, uh, if that was possible, but he does lead through people. I'm just, I'm trying to make a, I'm trying to make a point here. Um, guard, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life. It really is. Uh, don't, don't let it grow hard. Don't let it become calloused. Uh, grace, forgiveness, everything you can do to stay in that place of loving God and loving people. Everything you can do when you position yourself before the Lord and His presence just brings such humility because of the greatness of who He is. The more time we spend in His presence, the more, the more humble we are. The humility just comes forward to be in, uh, in awe of Him. You know, I, I love the church. I love this church, but I love the church. And I'll, I'll defend it and I'll guard it jealously because I know God's heart for it. I know it can get messy relationally, but every single mess that pops up is an opportunity for growth and maturity. When Jesus said that to Peter, get behind me, Satan, Peter had a choice. Peter had a choice to grow or to be offended. You can either get bitter or you can get better. And believe me, there's lots of opportunities. There, I took up the rest of the time. <laughs> what I wanted to do is I had a, um, I wanted Devin to come up and share a, a testimony. I wanted to leave it to the end because we'll use it as part of ministry to close, but um, I know that the testimony has so much power. A testimony um, releases a tangible anointing to actually see what is being testified happen again. And so I want Devin to come and testify, and then we will, uh, we will close in prayer this morning. You can come up, you can stay down, whatever you'd like. Good morning, everybody. Um, some of you will already partially know this story because it kind of it went out in a prayer request. Uh, but about a month ago, um, I came home from traveling out east. But a half an hour getting home, um, I experienced 10 on 10 pain in my head to the point that ambulance was called and I was rushed to Napanee Hospital. Napanee Hospital, they started to get the pain under control, but I started to lose right use of my right leg. And they got concerned, so they rushed me to Kingston. Um, in Kingston, they ran lots of tests. They were scared that I was having a brain bleed, that I was having stroke. Um, but everything came back clear. Uh, they just couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. They got my symptoms somewhat under control and sent me home. Um, the following weekend, um, I came here, Sunday morning, and, uh, but then ended up back in the hospital that afternoon for a couple of days. Um, dizzy, crazy pain in my head, uh, and they still couldn't figure out what was wrong. More testing, uh, more medications, and they finally released me again saying, oh, it'll pass. Um, it didn't. Uh, and so it continued on, just trying to cope with life. Um, it had a lot of direct effects, no driving, trouble walking, um, concentrating, all those kinds of things. Um, another week, I think it was, passed by, um, just kind of managing. Back here again, did some stuff in the afternoon, um, and then it was the fire starter night. Um, but by that point, I was tired, and I didn't feel like going anywhere. Um, many of you wonderful people have had been praying for me through that point because the email had gone out, um, and just family and friends gathering around me and praying. But uh, there, there was something that night I felt the Lord say, it doesn't matter how tired you are, you need to go. So I drug myself to Firestarter. Um, it was a great night, and Carla helped me walk in, 
hold my hand to keep me from falling over. And uh, something happened that night. My dizziness left. Uh, and walking out, Carla said, hey, there's something different. And I said, yeah. I said, I can walk. Like, I can, I'm fine. Like, I can do. But pain remained in my head. Um, give it uh, another week. But God had started the healing. I could tell something had changed. And things started getting better. Um, and the doctors still don't have it figured out. It's okay, they don't have to. Um, but it's been a week and a half now, and I'm healed. I'm symptom free. There's no more pains. Yeah. And we just want to give God the glory for it. Um, you know, honestly, I, I don't care what it was. I don't care, you know, if they ever really figure out what it was. It's okay, because he knows what it was, and he dealt with it. So we praise God. Is there anybody that has a physical need today you'd like to see healing for? You don't have to be shy to raise your hands. Wow, we're a pretty healthy church. I'm going to... I'm going to pray anyway. I, I, I know there's some, yes. Uh, let's, uh, let's exercise our faith in the presence of a testimony of healing. Father, we just thank you for the full gospel, for the full gospel ex experience, sozo, salvation, that is wholeness and fullness, complete salvation. Father, we believe right now for healing, for physical healing. God, I just pray in heads all the way to feet. I pray for healing for bones, for skin, for muscles, organs. God, we rebuke disease right now in Jesus' name. That is not our portion. Our portion is the wholeness and the fullness of God. God, we just speak right now. We declare the healing power of God to be released into this body, into these bodies right now in Jesus' name. We believe your kingdom has come on earth as it is in heaven. So let our bodies respond as if in heaven, Father. Let a release of healing happen in this season, God, I pray. Incredible testimonies. May we have whole services that are just full of testimony after testimony, testimony after testimony to the goodness of God and the power of God. Let that power be expressed and released right now in Jesus' name. It said the power of God was present to heal all, to heal all. So, Father, let that healing be released and manifest in bodies right now. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen.